how you do it. That's handy. Give folks a few minutes to join. And I forgot to mention this, um, Jess and Kate. I have somebody coming over to the house. I, I actually have a wasp's nest that I need to address. But hopefully, like I sent him pictures and. But if I have to just step away, I'll just. I'll just um, take a five minute break and then we'll come back. How's that? Hey, Larry. Do I see everyone? I think I have one more person. I think that you have to wait on um, on Kathy. Yes. Uh, although I don't see her in the in the others invited list. There she is. Did she I make it her. on? Yeah. Great. She just went on. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, right, so. Here we go. I'll let you right. take it over, Jess. Yes, well, welcome everyone. Um, we uh, do have a quorum for today, so that's great. Um, I think at this point, I turn it over to Susan to call the meeting to order. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Jess. Invisible. So, welcome everyone to today's Green Mountain Care Board Data Governance Council meeting. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda, so we will get right into it. Um, so first, I, I want to give a chair's report. Um, the board uh, during the summer, the Green Mountain Care Board is very busy with regulatory activities, as many of you know. But one item that I want to highlight for this group, and we will follow up with materials that you can share with your networks, um, we've been, we at the Green Mountain Care Board have been working on um, a project around hospital sustainability. It really started back in 2019 when unfortunately Springfield Hospital went bankrupt. Um, this is not unique to Vermont. Rural hospitals across the country are facing severe challenges and there's been many, many bankruptcies. So um, we at the Green Mountain Care Board, um, worked with uh, the hospitals and then also with the legislature to do work around hospital sustainability with the thought of making sure that these hospitals are here for patients and communities and that we get ahead of the inevitable in some areas across the country, like I said, where things are so bad that we don't have a choice and, and hospitals are forced to close. So. Um, we've been working on this, like I said, since 2019. Um, we, in part of Act 167, the board is leading work on community engagement to transform hospitals. And that is what we're about to do in the next month. And that is that we're going out to the communities to um, share with them what our expert 
uh, physician leader from Oliver Wyman is recommending on hospital sustainability. So please be aware that this is coming up in July. Again, we're going to post all the materials on our website and we will send each and every one of you packets so you can share with your networks. Um, these piece, these meetings are in person in July, starting July 8th. So we're hope, hopeful that we can get a good uh, response from the communities on this incredibly important area, healthcare, obviously, in rural communities. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to call out one of our long-term uh, council members and member of our healthcare community, and that's Kathy Fulton, who is about to retire. So I think this is your last meeting, right, Kathy? Yes. Yes. So thank you. Oh. Thank you so much oh. for serving and helping us over the years. You're one of the original members, I think. I think so. Yes. And we wish you well. And um, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Well, don't catch up, but not too soon, Susan. Definitely. <laughs> the board needs definitely, you. definitely. Thank you. So with that, um, I will turn it to the next agenda item, which is the approval of the February meeting minutes. I I move approval of the February meeting minutes. Do I have a second? A second. second. Okay. Oh. Um, any discussion or questions from the council members? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And all those opposed, say nay. Okay, the meeting minutes from February have been approved. Um, so the next item, and I just need to look at my cheat sheet here so I don't mess this up. Um, the next item is a new council member designation. So um, Stacy Gibson Granfield from ADS um, has filled in for a few months for the ADS, um, for the seat that is currently occupied by ADS. Um, Kate, correct me or just that is not a specified ADS seat, correct? That is correct. It's not a specified seat, uh, although we always have uh, had the wanted to have the chief data officer yeah, from ADS on the, yeah, on the council. Thank you. I just wanted to get that right. Um, so Stacy uh, has recommended to us that Josiah, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, so he can let us know the next, he isn't here today, but the next time, next time we have a meeting, he can pronounce it correctly. Raish, I think um, he is the chief data officer at ADS, and um, her recommendation would be that we nom we um, nominate him and replace Stacy with Josiah. So I would like to propose that. Um, like I said, he was unable to attend today, but he will be able to attend at our next meeting. So do I have a motion? filling um, the vacancy left by Stacy Gibson Granfield uh, with Josiah Raish, the Chief Data Officer at ADS. I can make the motion. Great, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. Great. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, great. Looking forward to welcoming Josiah. I've heard wonderful things about him. Haven't met him personally, but um, I know he's going to be a great addition to our Data Governance Council. Susan, I can yes. add that we, uh, the staff, uh, the data and analytics staff at the Green Mountain Care Board have met with Josiah a couple of times. He's fantastic. He's got some great. really good vision for the state. And uh, he's working on some some pretty big projects uh, that around um, uh, cybersecurity and just all kinds of things. We're learning about uh, a lot of that vision and our involvement in that. Uh, so um, I, we're we're just very fortunate that he's in that position and that he will 
help us uh, at the Green Mountain Care Board with our data governance. Yes, super. Great, great addition. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so moving on to our next item on the agenda, and that is the data linkage request from the UVM Larner College of Medicine. I'm going to turn it over to Jessman Disable, who will introduce this project and provide a brief summary, and then she'll turn it over to the uh, UVM Larner College of Medicine researchers. Turn it to you, Jess. Okay, thanks. So, um, so you did receive in your materials packet the linkage request that UVM submitted to the GMCB data and analytics team. Um, we've performed our review of this request, and so it's coming to council for your review. Um, UVM is looking to link the data from the Vermont Breast Cancer Surveillance System to the vCures data to understand breast cancer screening patterns in Vermont um, and how that maybe has changed over time. So um, I see that Brian's here, so I think I'll just turn it over to um, Brian uh, and possibly your other teammates to, to present. And I don't know if you have any slides to share, but if, I'll go ahead and stop sharing the agenda just so we can focus on you. Thank you. Sure, great, thank you. Hopefully folks can hear me. Uh, thanks so much for having me on here today and considering this request. Uh, my name is Brian Sprague. I'm a professor in the Department of Surgery at UVM, and I lead the Cancer Population Sciences Program within the UVM Cancer Center. Um, I'm a breast cancer epidemiologist, and uh, most of my work revolves around um, a research program centered on the Vermont Cancer Surveillance System. Um, you, if you're familiar at all with it, you may have heard it referred to as the Vermont Mammography Registry, which was kind of our original name. Um, it's a little, we changed our name because we do more than mammography now, of course, studying breast ultrasound, breast MRI, um, but it is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just call it the Mammography mm -hmm. Registry sometimes. Um, so we do a lot of research on all aspects of breast cancer epidemiology, but one topic in particular is monitoring uh, screening mammography utilization in Vermont. Uh, so we collect data from radiology facilities in Vermont, um, including the types and results of breast imaging exams uh, that patients undergo, and we also get um, like essentially like a, a basic demographics and risk factor questionnaire along with that data. And so we've been able to monitor trends in uh, screening mammography over time in Vermont. This, I should note, this registry dates back to like the mid 1990s. So it's quite a resource um, and just amazing that it was ever set up by my predecessors. And I've been very fortunate uh, to take it on over the last 10 years or so. Uh, but one of the things we've been seeing is uh, a decline in mammography screening in the state of Vermont, uh, essentially since the year 2009, uh, which is when happens, maybe coincidence, maybe not, is when uh, one of these rounds of uh, breast cancer screening recommendations came through that was controversial that recommended routine screening beginning at age 50 instead of age 40 with informed decision making for women in their 40s. Um, and that seems to have been an inflection point and for reasons, you know, not fully understood, which is why we're kind of putting this forward, is uh, we've, we've seen this real steady decline in screening utilization with a drop of about 1% per year, per year since 2009. So we went from having about 70% of women adherent to the recommendations. Now we're down to around 60% of women adherent to the recommendations. Um, and we just recently published a paper Kind of showing these trends um, and we you know we could show a real strong dip of course during the pandemic and it bounced back up after the pandemic but you could see it hasn't bounced all the way back up to where it was and it's really still riding this slow steady downward trend um, and we've kind of done what we could with our mammography registry data to try to analyze these trends but thought we could do a much more comprehensive analysis with access to information through the vCurious Claims database. Um, so I collaborated with uh, my co-investigator, co Sarah Nowak, who perhaps some of you are familiar with. She's a health services researcher with a lot of experience analyzing claims data. And we thought by linking our databases, we could really create a, a super strong data set that would allow us to look at uh, multiple aspects and multiple levels 
um, of this issue and see if we can zero in further on what might be driving uh, some of these changes in, in screening utilization. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. I've worked closely with Caitlin Damon, who I think is on the call and has helped me kind of work through like uh, what we think is a good uh, strategy for linking the data in terms of utilizing OnPoint and uh, storing the data within the vCures uh, environment at UVM. Uh, so hopefully, I'm not sure if, if you've all have had a chance to review precisely what's been proposed there, uh, but we can answer questions and I'm sure Caitlin can chime in on that as well. Um, so maybe, I, I know that was perhaps brief. Uh, I'm not sure what particularly you might be interested in, but I'm happy to take any questions or provide any further info. Great. Um, Jess, do you want me to open it up to the council members for questions? Um, I So can I just, just for a PSA, what are the guide, what's the guidance now for screening? Yeah. I mean, that's so yeah. terrible that I'm like, well, I, I mean, I'm over 50, so, you know, yeah, I go yeah. every year, but maybe just yeah. as a PSA, that would that's, be helpful. Sure, and that's a great point because the guidelines just changed again in April. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh. it's, um, it, and, you know, these are the guidelines from the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, which has kind of been the one, you know, they have big ramifications for insurance coverage and things like that. Um, and they've kind of flip-flopped over the years, but particularly around women in their 40s. Um, so for the last decade or so, it was informed decision making for women in their 40s and then biennial screening. So screening every two years for women 50 to 74. Um, with their latest recommendations, they've put it back to starting at age 40 again. So now the recommendation is screen every two years, ages 40 to 74. Okay. Uh, and so that's I, my sense is that those kind of bouncing around recommendations have not helped matters. Um, and with every kind of round of those, there's a lot of debate about the benefits and harms of mammography, including the false positive rates and just right. a lot of like yeah. media attention around that. Like, why are we not recommending it all the time for everyone? Um, that might be, you know, I'm a person, you know, as well, who has to undergo cancer screening for other things. And I know like, it's really easy to look for an excuse to be like, Maybe I won't do that this year. Maybe I don't really need right. to do that. Yeah, you know, right. it doesn't take right. much to push you in that direction. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's super helpful. Um, and I want to make sure the other council members have questions. But um, uh, just from my experience in this on this council, we've worked with um, the UVM folks in the past and have found it to be really um, impactful and helpful. Um, some of the other linkage requests. And then this is probably, I know the answer to this question, but when you, like if you're, if you're, you know, publishing a paper or anything, that will come through us. We'll see that right sure. before it. I mean, sure, yeah. we're, okay. we're, I'm, I'm very yes. interested yes, in it. You will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. That, okay. That's part of our current agreement is that okay. we will send publications to you before. Yeah. That's what I thought. Wonderful. Okay, let me um, open it up to the other council members if there are any questions. I have a question. Um, I'm I'm just very interested. Uh, I I do see in the um, in the summary of your study that you have identified race and ethnicity and education as um, factors that are associated with lower likelihood of breast cancer screenings mm -hmm. and I don't I'm wondering where how this data linkage will help you with that I don't think that you'll find those data richly populated in vCures but I was just wondering if maybe it is already in um in yeah. your surveillance system exactly I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit I was curious yeah so we do have that in our surveillance system and so that's one of those things where I'd like to see if some of the variables you all have or you know that are in the cures if we mm -hmm. can understand if they're mediating some of those associations that we do see you know whether it's things like insurance status or um, primary care engagement and um, 
that could you know give us a better clue about what's driving some of those differences we observe on that you know 30,000 foot view. Uh, have uh, do, uh, I have one more question? I see Larry, you have your hand up, but um, I don't. Have you uh, talked about the the logistics with On Point yet, or will you do that if and when you're approved here? I I wasn't sure. That, when you that's, engage that's them. That's my plan. I haven't checked when you okay. engage them. I'm not sure, uh, Caitlin, if you have any comments on that. But I think that we were seeing that as our next step. We yeah, we usually wait to engage with them until we have approval. OK, uh, th that's totally fair. I was going to ask a question about, you know, the, you know, feasibility and the likelihood of, a you know, a, you know, is this the right approach? And st but I think that you'll probably get there after after this. Um, and if there have to be any changes to the kind of the logistical um, uh, process, uh, you'll you'll um, address that with on point directly. So I will hold my question. I'm all set, thank you. Thanks, Kate. And Larry, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the kind of detailed data flow logistics. I was just curious, just clarifying a little bit about that. So um, if I understand correctly, you'll have um, basically hashed identifier uh, or the hash identifier with the vcures data um, once you have all the data in your system um, but not no real identifiers in there you would be able to if if you wanted to you could identify the patients if you wanted to but you're just choosing to keep that de-identified is that right maybe i should let caitlin comment on that in terms of we won't have the identifiers with with the hashed IDs at any point. I think, right. um, Caitlin, I don't know if you want to further comment on that or you know the feasibility of linking that sure. if someone desired to. Yeah. So, um, because obviously both data sets get to exist broadly in the UVM environment, what our plan was is that um, the hash identifier that links to our mammography database, um, all of those fields will exist on the server where we keep our vCares data. Um, and I do, and vCares data can't, the rule is vCares data row level cannot leave that environment. So you couldn't bring it back over to the mammography server and identify the vCares data. Um, so any data that Brian is going to use for this project, we will pull the vCares data um, with the hash ID and the mammography ID, and then he'll have to bring in the mammography ID to the vCares server and only can link it there and it can't leave that environment. So there's only like an inflow to the vCares mm -hmm. server. There's not an outflow that mm -hmm. allows for that re-identification. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then things like race or ethnicity or other characteristics will go in with the vCures data, right? Race and ethnicity are fields included in the vCures database. But then if he or brings over, he could bring yeah. them over from the mammography database as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But okay. we've we've said that names and a few other fields we've identified, those can't leave the mammography server and come over. So there's no... So those re-identification fields won't be there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Lowry. Um, Kathy. Um, thank you, Brian. This is great. And the application looks, you know, spot on. Um, technically everything looks wonderful. My question is a little different. I'm just kind of curious if um other states are um, sharing similar observations? Are there similar processes and any opportunities for um, com you know, comparing performance and kind of aggregating findings? Um, you know, knowing that On Point is based in Maine, are, are they kind okay. of curious about the same thing too? And yeah. you know, what opportunities could potentially exist there? 
Yeah, that's a great, a great point. Uh, to answer the, maybe the first part of that, um, just to comment on maybe where Vermont stands, we've done some work using national survey study data um, and seeing that Vermont, we used, 10 years ago, we used to be up in the, like, the top 10 or so for mammography rates. And yep. we've had one of the largest declines over the oh. past 10 years amongst, it was like the second largest decline across the nation. Um, and now we're down to number 38 in the rankings for mammography screening. Um, so it's quite striking. Wow. Um, and it, the same thought has crossed my mind about trying to compare and contrast with some other regions. Um, if you look at the country as a whole, there's been a more modest decline in screening utilization, uh, but not as strong as we've seen here. So it, it makes you wonder like, how are we different? And you know, and yeah. your comment about Maine is, is uh, resonates with me. Um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with uh, we call it the Northern New England Clinical and Translational Research Center oh, yep. that yeah. Vermont and Maine are part of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually, we we submitted a supplemental funding grant application that is providing some of the funds to support this linkage and the analyses. And uh, Maine is um, a, like a collaborating institution on that, that I'm, I'm very eager to explore opportunities for doing some of some of the work you just described to try to uh, see if we can do some similar analyses elsewhere and see what might be different or the same. Yeah. Oh, that that's really encouraging. And even though I'll just be um, Joe Citizen, I will look forward to um, <laughs> I'll hunt down your reports and findings. <laughs> great. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Kathy. Any other council questions? Okay. Um, so, Josh, should I open it up for public comment now? I think, and, and Kate, maybe, should I do that now or should we call for a vote? I think, doesn't, I could do it either. I think I'm going to do public comment now, see if there are any questions from the public. And please direct those through me. Okay, so hearing none, I will um, move to approve the data linkage request as presented by UVM Learner College of Medicine today, June 4th, 2024. And I uh, will make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion from the council members? Okay. So all those in favor say aye. 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 And all those opposed say nay. Okay. So Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your support and your interest. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, good luck Thank with you. the work and thank you for the work. We're eager to hear results and I'm just like so depressed that our, our rates are so low. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. That's I have distressing. No idea. It's really distressing, right? And like yeah. I had no idea. Wow. Okay. Well, we thank you. Here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Okay. So I can pull up my agenda here. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the data reporting manual changes update. And Lindsay Kill on our team, uh, who is the, now the deputy director of data and analytics at the GMCB will present um, the proposed changes and timeline and will she'll recommend a vote today. So Lindsay. Hi everyone. Um, I just have a quick question for you, Kate. Um, do, you, do you want to drive those slides or do you want me to drive? Oh, whatever you would like. I don't have the slides up. Maybe Jess, you do if you want to 
extract them. I can. Sorry, I wasn't I. <laughs> no, that's OK. I have them. I just wanted to check. All right. All right. So. Um, so today we are go we're having a meeting with the potential vote on the manual changes. Uh, I'm going to just go through each of the changes and um, actually I'm uh, Kate, can you let me know, should I pause after each one or should I go through all of them? What do you think? Um, what would the, I, there are a lot of changes that you're going to be proposing here today. Um, the council did have a chance to hear about them um, a while ago, though you might not remember. <laughs> um, so I think it was mm -hmm. either October or December uh, meeting. Um, I, you know what, Lindsay? I think that there are a lot, uh, but why don't you go through them all and then uh, and then we'll just circle back to the, you know, if there are questions about the, the changes. Mm -hmm. And I think the council members maybe just jot down notes to, yeah. you know, and then we can go back. Okay, great. All right. Um, so first proposed change. This would be changing a field, the values in the field to collect more detail on coverage type. And this would be for self-funded enrollees. Um, this variable, um, the data element name is coverage type. And right now, um, the current definition is that we use this field to report the type of coverage which distinguishes the self-funded plans from other commercial plans. And right now, today, it's ASO or ASW, and then um, the STN, UND, or other. And so what we're proposing is to further distinguish mandatory reported self-funded enrollees from the voluntarily reported self-funded enrollees. And that would make it easier for us to identify those plans. And OnPoint, um, we talked with OnPoint about that change and they said it might be easiest to just add a V or an M after ASO and ASW. So that would be that would expand the current value set by adding um, those two additional distinctions. Okay, so that's the first proposed change. So the second proposed change is adding a new field. Um, this would be an added field to collect a flag for high deductible plans. The data element name would be high deductible health plan flag. And we would use this field to indicate whether the member has a, was covered under a high deductible plan as defined by the US Internal Revenue Service at the start of the plan year. And so the values in that variable would be yes, no, or unknown. The third proposed change would be to add a field to collect the state in which the plan is uh, sold or issued, and this would be titled plan state. Um, we would use this field to report the state in which the plan is um, sold or issued, CITES, and, and the those codes would be the ones that are maintained by the U.S. Postal Service and the Canada Post, so it would be the abbreviations would be for all 50 states, like VT for Vermont. Um, the fourth proposed change would be to um, add a field to collect the billing provider tax ID. That's the name that it would we would give it, billing provider tax ID, and it would report the federal taxpayer identification number for that um, billing provider, which is generally a, like an organization level. So that value set would obviously vary. Fifth proposed change is to add a field to collect the attending provider NPI. Um, so this would expand our list of provider NPIs. 
um, attending provider NPI would be the name, and it would be mapping our the attending information to the NPI from the NPES registry on the institutional claims. So um, obviously the value set there can can vary. The SIC proposed change is to add a field to collect in and out in and out of network uh, indicator, and this would be for medical and pharmacy claims only. Um, and this would report whether the rendering provider was in or out of network um, on that date of service for that service. And so there are four values in that value set, in network, I for in network, O for out of network, N for not applicable, and U for unknown. The seventh proposed change is to add a field to collect, um, to expand the number of ICD procedure codes that we currently collect. So we do have some right now, but this would make that list larger. Um, we would call it other ICD procedure code, and this would be used to report any additional ICD procedure codes that are listed sequentially. It only applies to inpatient claims, um, and it would be repeated for all the the claim lines. It would be null for professional claims. That should say professional claims. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, as are other codes, it would not include a decimal point. And so there are, are many codes that would be in that value set. I think this is the eighth and final one. Yep. The eighth proposed change is to add, um, so, uh, we have, there are four procedure code modifiers in the database currently, but we only collect, we only intake the data for two of them. So we would add the last two fields to collect procedure code modifier three and four. Um, so that would help indicate if a service or procedure has been altered by a specific circumstance, um, which may change, uh, yeah, has been altered by a specific circumstance. Um, and then for um, public comment, we received two comments during the affected submitter meetings. Um, the one comment is asking for more than 120 days. And the second comment um, is regarding coverage type. ASOV and ASOM is sufficient. No need to differentiate for stop loss or group excess insurance and our responses this is this distinction is standard across other apcds it is um as proposed as aligned with the common data layout and vcure submitters are currently using this distinction to send a fairly wide distribution of asw and aso plans and then we did not receive any written public comment is that should I go over this slide as well, or should we meet? Should we wait for each question? Um, I think we should wait to see if there are questions from the council. And one of mine you answered in really more of a um, due diligence and and public comment period. I believe I, I this was also posted on our website for public comments and you did not receive any written public comments. You received the other two at one of your meetings internally. Okay, great. All right, any questions from, thank you, Lindsay. Very thorough. Any questions from the council? Um, Susan, th yeah. this is, this is Kathy. Just a quick question on the I, um, the other ICD-10 codes. Is there an upper limit for the number of codes that would be collected? Like a like a max of twenty or twenty five, or mm -hmm. or will will the change mean that however many codes are listed, they can then be um, retained? Um, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. We can take it back to OnPoint and ask, 
my, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not totally sure. My hunch is that it would be limited to some number, but I don't recall us specifically talking about that upper bound. I don't know if you do, Kate. Okay. No, All right. I don't that. Okay, we can take that back to on point and get that. It's a good question. And yeah, Lindsay, it's it's not to be limiting in any way. I you know, I, I personal opinion would be the more the merrier and 20 <laughs> is an awful lot. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious. Um, one thing that I, I I don't have a, any questions about this, but I would like to add just a little bit of context when uh, we sort of made an informal policy decision when we were able to make changes to the data reporting manual that we would consult um, the APCD Council's common data layout. And so some and so all of these uh, recommended changes or additions, are consistent with the common data layout. Mm -hmm. And although we, not all of our, the fields that we collect are um, part of or consistent with the common data layout, but we thought as we look to make changes in new fields, um, that's that's a, a you know potentially good resource. And so, um, so that's why the language looks the way it does, even if in some cases it seems a little funny for Vermont, mm -hmm. but we do actually have um, a, quite a few payers across the country that are that uh, that do use these common data layout fields. And so there is some consistency there. Um, I don't know if down the line, um, you know, there would ever be an appetite for the council to think about um, adopting the common data layout. There's probably history there as to why we didn't in the first place. I think, I think it's probably legacy actually, like that's newer yeah. than the vCares database. And we were only recently able to make changes to the, um, required reporting. So, uh, but I, I wonder if that might be, uh, something that the council might be interested in, um, in talking about the pros and cons and, you know, the impacts that that would have. I like that idea, Kate. Yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. I was just going to say, you know, I, before you made that statement, Kate, I was going to say anything that moves in that, you know, path, you know, in that direction of that shared alignment with the common data layout and just, you know, more um, consistency and, um, you know, comparability with other states. I think that's definitely moving in the right direction. If I can throw my two cents in the ring. <laughs> yeah, we'll make note and maybe bring up the discussion at a future meeting and do a little pros and cons and all of that stuff. That's great. Thanks, Kate and Kathy. Any other questions or comments from the council members? Any public comment here today? Uh, we've had a very, very lengthy public comment open for a while at our on our um, website at Green Mountain Care Board. But for folks who may not have seen that and are here today, we'd love to hear your comments if you have any. Very quiet group today. <laughs> All right, so um, seeing no comments, I will move to approve revising the vCures data reporting manual to reflect the field changes and additions as presented by Deputy Director Kill at the June 4th, 2024 Data Governance Council meeting. And that would be if, I guess, do I need to? I think that's all part of one motion, effective to 125. I, I think it should be two motions, Susan, okay. um, because just to 
for the council Just members to, to be able clear. to discuss the implementation period because sure. that's a recommendation of the staff. But yeah, um, yeah. So we, we might want to uh, have it separate. So okay. So, yeah. So, so do I have a second for the first motion? Second. Okay. Any discussion from the council? When would that be effective? Well, that we're gonna um, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Do that as a second motion. <laughs> That's what I was just oh, asking oh, about. Oh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. We're, we're, se we're <laughs> yeah. separating them out for that reason. Um, good question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And all those opposed, say nay. Okay, so the first motion has been approved. And then the the I'll motion to require implementation of changes on... 2-1-2025, 20, which is the staff recommendation. Um, do I have a second? Kathy, you have a question. I do have a question. Do you want to wait until <laughs> it's uh, 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 for discussion? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think someone yeah, should second it, it and then we'll have a discussion. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, okay thanks, and then Kate. you can go into discussion. And then yeah, I'll okay. open it up to discussion. Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's didn't mean okay. to jump the gun there. Um, <laughs> just curious why it wouldn't start with the beginning of the calendar year mm -hmm. to have a whole year uh, as opposed to mid, like one month missing. Lindsay, do you oh, have an that's, answer? Yeah, um, Lindsay, chime in. That's a that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I th I think uh, it was more, you know, it was more like trying to balance, let's give payers more time because this is June, so 120 days is, you know, we, we've heard yeah. loud and clear, like, so it's not non-trivial to, you know, to make changes even when they look like they're, you know, they're just adding a few fields um, on, on our end. Um, and then s effective January, it just seemed like December is, you know, sort of a hard time to yeah. scramble to to get um, to get the I changes see. in place. But that's a really yeah. good question. And I wonder, Lindsay, if you have some thoughts about that, um, which is a good reason to be in discussion around the um, implementation date. Yeah, I I was also thinking that this related to the last date that we had um, yeah. had changes, uh, implementation of changes from the last vote we did. So I think that that date was 2 one Exactly. So yeah. like mm. there's, um, we know that it's, it's a lot to ask payers to make these changes. And so I think part of this was trying to give us a lot of space and time um, for those changes. From a, a data, um, you know, coming in point of view, is it, is it, you know, would it be more um, value, w w would there be more value to having data, these new data fields coming in effective that, you know, for the whole calendar year or? Um, I think that Trying to think of like some of the initiatives that we have happening. Um, I think that for some of some of the variables, it won't make a big difference, but for others, it it may. Like if we do want a full year of um, yeah. to analyze something, then we would have to wait for you know 2026 or do a trailing 12 month analysis, um, which yeah. is possible. Um, but in that case, I would, I would recommend pushing the time out further instead of mm -hmm. moving it up. Like if we wanted, yeah. for example, like a state fiscal year, mm -hmm. so July to June, I would push this to July 1, 2025. I, I wouldn't shorten the amount of time for, yeah. um, for insurers. Does that answer your question? Kathy, yeah, I I was just you know thinking in terms of um it, like it would be forever footnoted as 
for that year, 11 months versus 12 right. months. And, you know, that, and over time that gets forgotten and, you right. know, funky result type stuff. But mm -hmm. um, I certainly appreciate the uh, time frame for change. <laughs> yeah. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, now I'm thinking I should, do I need to have public comment? I think I should just because I didn't, I did before, I, but just because this might be a payer specific. Yeah, I think it's fair to, yeah. you know, to hear that, that changes and, our, you know, our motion. Um, any public comment before we take a vote? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor for um, implementation of changes of these changes for two one twenty five say aye. 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 Okay, uh, any of any opposed? Okay. I just want to uh, clarify. I wasn't sure if Jesse. Oh yeah. You voted. Uh, sorry, I did vote on the first one. I just accidentally didn't hit. Uh, I accidentally didn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> and to be honest, I was still thinking about the second one because I am a little bit worried about the two one twenty five. Uh, Timeline, um, but I, I will go by. Uh, do you want to change the motion? Do you want to? What What are you thinking? Um, like I mean, pushing I it do, out further? Yeah, I do think it might be better to push it out further because I had the same question as Kathy. Um, do you have? Uh, is there a but, date? But, well, that's what I was. Yeah, but it's like, through. what's the right date? Right. The right date. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Lindsay said maybe the fiscal year, but uh, does that kind of go? Is that the same thing? You know, then it's less of the year. Um, I guess what is most of the analysis done on for a timeline? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Sorry to be a hang up here. I was just processing. No, that's a good question. Um, I think for the most part, I can only speak for like the analyses that we do at the board. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, we use calendar year um, from VCures or we use hospital fiscal year, which I believe is October 1st. First, yeah. I can be a um, but I'm also just like looking through some of these variables. I just wanted to remind myself like which of these would be like, could we not infer that it was that that was the case in January? So I would have to ask, I would have to talk with the payers about does in versus out of network change month to month or does is a network set for like a period of time. Um, a, mm. So that one I would need more information on. Um, we would be I'm just trying to see really quickly, like. I think these last two are really specific to the claim, but the other the first five would not be impacted by when the data change would go into effect because we could infer that that was right. the case, you know, in and prior I, months. Yeah. And I, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Did you want to add? No, no, I just said okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I, I may be thinking of this wrong, but if like we were to move it out later, then it would be if you were looking for a year, I, if there were like, plan years or something that it would be half a year instead of 11 months um so that kind of makes that sways me more to say keep it at 2-1 instead of pushing it back but kathy mm -hmm. go ahead 
would it be possible to kind of have a um, almost like a sliding scale of of interim dates? Um, say, but even using January one as a um, you know this this would be the ideal target date. I see. But yeah. If if you can't make that, then um, seven one as a mid year at least. Right. At least it's a midway point. It's half the year. I see. Yeah, and total drop dead by October one. You know, mandatory. Yeah. Like tier it. Yeah, that's actually yeah. A, an interesting approach. Um, Kate, do you want to add? Yes, uh, uh, I do. Um, I think that that is a great approach, and actually, we do have it built in um, already. So, he, um, I think I would move to amend the motion mm -hmm. to take effect July, uh, January 1st of 2025, but payers, it's it's in our rule that pay, um, that there is a waiver process. If you cannot, okay. you, yeah. uh, you know, you can't accommodate that that implementation date, you can ask for a waiver. And we, we did have to go through that when we made changes in 2023 with quite a few payers. And uh, this, the process works. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that would be my proposal to amend the implementation date to be January 1st. So for the vast majority of payers or for the vast majority of, of data fields, you know, we can hopefully shoot for implementation of January 1st. That's still 180 days roughly, which is more than 120, which is the minimum. Um, and and then we can work with payers if for some of the fields they need additional time. I like that. Yeah. I second that. Okay, great. Thank you all. That was a great discussion. Okay. So all those in favor of the amended motion that Kate just shared, which would be effective 1-1-25, one, one, but knowing that there's a waiver process within our rule that could stagger the implementation if needed. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Yeah. And all those opposed say nay. Okay, great. Susan. Thank you so much. Yes. yes. I, I don't know if this applies in this forum, but I was just looking online at Robert's rules and yeah. when you want to reconsider a motion that's already been carried you have to make a motion to reconsider the motion oh okay and then and so Good if everyone know. agrees to reconsider oh, yes, then right. you vote okay so, so should i back it up I, <laughs> Good, i'm guessing that everyone's point. amenable but <laughs> it seemed like everyone was amenable but it or that sometimes there's a a friendly amendment and what's the difference between a friendly amendment and a but it's a new well, that's motion during that's right before right. it's been voted on yeah. right perfect thank you learned something new today <laughs> great okay thank you so much everyone thank you lindsay you're welcome so uh we have some staff updates a staff update so um Ross McCracken, who was wonderful, um, was uh, has left the board. He, good news, he's still with state government, and he's working at the Department of Financial Regulation, which apparently finances his 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 real uh, passion, uh, legal finance. So we miss him. We wish him well, and we still get to um, interact with him, which makes us happy. Um, so. I can um, open it up to any other, uh, I think public comment is next, or did I go out of order? Let me see. Keep having have to toggle back. Yeah, public comment. Okay. And is there any, thank you, Jess, any new or old business to come before the council? We were very efficient today. <laughs> thank you all. A lot of, a lot of thank you, Jessamyn Disable, and Kate is still chipping in here, um, and Lindsay, of course, and others for getting us so organized. Um, really appreciate it. Great. 
Great, and our next meeting is when? Is it August? Sorry, yes, August 6th. Great. Tuesday, August 6th. Wonderful. I think, is that right? Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Good to double check. check Kathy, again. you have your hand up. Just to say thank you all for the privilege Aww. of partnering with you on the Green Mountain Care Board Data Governance Council. And it's just been um, a wonderful period of time and just so happy to see all the effective changes this council has brought forward to make the cures in more interoperable and usable and as I think, you know, my drumbeat uh, start to enable the meaningful part of meaningful use. And just yeah. thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Kathy. We Kathy, couldn't have done it without you. All of your years yeah. of service um, and for all of your contributions on the council. We've worked together for a very long time and we will miss yeah. you very, very much. I actually have a question. I wonder uh, if you can talk about who will replace you as the executive director at VPQ? Oh, happy to share. I'm very, oh, okay. very proud and excited to um, announce that Hel Hillary Wolfley will be okay. the executive director oh, at Effective July 1. Wonderful. So a, a well-deserved, uh, very smooth transition. It's always, um, you know, in in a big major track meet, it's always, it, it's always <laughs> yes. interesting to me, like, how how can they pass the baton or drop the baton in a relay race? Like, how can you do that? But it actually is pretty easy. And Absolutely. we've taken great pains to make sure there will be no baton dropping. And um, Hillary's going to be a wonderful uh, new leader for the Vermont wonderful. Program for Quality in Healthcare. So that's great. Yes. Congratulations to her and to yes. you. Uh, and the organization is very fortunate to have her at the coming up to the helm. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you for asking that, Kate. Yes. I, yes. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> great. All right. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. In a second. I'll second. And all those in favor say aye. Bye. 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 Have a wonderful summer, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Everyone Bye. enjoy. And a wonderful retirement to you, Kathy. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.